Hello everyone, this is Tom Fox. I'm the Compliance Evangelist, and I would like to welcome you to a special five-part podcast series sponsored by Affiliated Monitors on strategies for corporations and corporate compliance programs under the new DOJ guidance issued in 2018. First, a word about Affiliated Monitors. Founded in 2004 and celebrating its 15th anniversary this year, Indeed, this month, Affiliated Monitors provides professional, independent integrity monitoring and ethics and compliance assessments nationally and internationally and across almost all industries. With its knowledge of effective ethics and compliance programs and cultures, Affiliated Monitors is respected for its work as the corporate monitor on matters ranging from multinational corporations to small and mid-sized companies and even individuals. Having served in over 700 monitorships, no one has more experience as an independent monitor than the team at Affiliated Monitors. For more information on how an independent monitor can help you improve your company's compliance and ethics program, please visit our sponsor, Affiliated Monitors, at their website, www.affiliatedmonitors.com. Over the course of this five-part podcast series, we'll discuss some of the new DOJ guidance that came out in 2018, what companies can do with it both internally and externally, how a strong compliance program can be used as both a sword and a shield, and what are the benefits of using a third party to fulfill your compliance mandate. In this fourth episode, I'm joined by Eric Feldman, where we discuss using compliance as both a shield and a sword. Hello, everyone. This is Tom Fox back again for part four of our five-part exploration of strategies for corporations under the new DOJ guidance. Today, I'm joined by Eric Feldman. Eric Eric is a senior vice president of Affiliated Monitors, and we take up a very interesting uh, topic that I enjoy debating, which is can a strong compliance program uh, be used as a shield or a sword or perhaps even both? So, Eric, welcome back. Thanks, Tom. Happy to be here. Eric, we uh, in a pre- previous podcast, we talked about the Brzezinski memo and how uh, I think both of us believe it can be used uh, to determine the monitor selection process. But could we take that a step further and say it's actually a roadmap to avoiding a monitor? Well, absolutely, uh, Tom. And, and l- let's take a step back to uh, what the memo does say about monitors um, and Benzkowski says that monitorship appointments are not going to be taken lightly and will be required only when clearly warranted. So then the question comes to pass, when is a monitor warranted and what can a company do uh, to set the conditions where a monitor might not be warranted? And if you dig further into the memo, It talks about um, the factors that a prosecutor is directed to consider, among other things, as to whether or not there's a benefit to having a monitor. Those include whether the underlying misconduct involved something as systemic as manipulation of corporate books and records or exploitation of an inadequate compliance program. That tells you right up front that they're very interested in whether or not a compliance program uh, is designed and implemented effectively. The second question is, was the misconduct pervasive across the organization or approved or facilitated by senior level management? There you have the concept of tone at the top and whether or not senior level managers are contributing to the misconduct or creating the kind of culture that's necessary to prevent misconduct. The third question is, did the corporation make significant investments in and improvements to its corporate compliance program and internal controls? So they're looking for evidence that the company uh, surrounding the misconduct made significant investment in the compliance program to remediate it, to improve it, and to strengthen the controls that may have failed that led to the misconduct. So they're looking for demonstrated remediation. And the fourth is uh, have those improvements to the compliance program and the controls been tested 
to demonstrate they prevent or detect similar misconduct in the future. Now, that's the first time I've seen in the DOJ policy document the concept of testing a compliance program and testing internal controls. That's, that gives an opportunity for companies uh, to do something very different to try to avoid a monitor. So, Eric, it, uh, it occurs to me that uh, by using the reforms that you have just articulated the four points, that can be a very big step uh, for the company, not only in its negotiation with the Department of Justice, but actually as a proactive approach to lower the threat and uh, a potential re- recurrence. Uh, if, if you agree with that, and, and I hope you do, are there some specific areas where you see this in action? Well, absolutely. I think that, um, you know, DOJ has made it pretty clear before uh, this Benzkowski memo guidance on the use of monitors, uh, the kinds of things that they want to see in a compliance program. As monitors, when we have participated in fraud section monitorships, uh, we're guided by the uh, evaluation criteria that were developed by Wei Chen and put up and still are up on the DOJ website. And DOJ prosecutors, even in the absence of way, are looking at those criteria to determine whether or not a company is uh, doing what it should be doing uh, for its compliance program. Now, when you look at the Benzkowski memo and combine it with some other DOJ guidance, the picture becomes even clearer. So. Going back to uh, the FCPA corporate enforcement policy, Uh, the enforcement policy uh, basically states uh, pretty clearly that if a company voluntarily discloses wrongdoing and, and participates in timely and appropriate remediation, there's a presumption that there's going to be a declination of prosecution. And that's the first thing a company is looking for. So remediation of compliance is right up front. And then when you look at some of the statements that the deputy attorney general has made uh, back in November, um, he said that he is incorporating the and has incorporated the FCPA corporate enforcement policy into the United States attorney's manual. And the Aspects of it that are critical have to do with corporate compliance programs and the criticality of those programs to getting a declination. And now with the Benzkowski memo, avoiding a monitor. This goes beyond FCPA uh, because looking at some of the other principles that others in DOJ have said, for example, the Securities and Financial Fraud Unit chief said that DOJ is going to apply apply the same FCPA corporate enforcement policy guidelines to declinations on non-farm bribery cases and extending that, the same uh, principles would apply to avoiding a monitor in non-FCPA cases. Eric, from your perspective, do you see, uh, I guess I just, I see a couple of things that are perhaps observations. The first is you spoke about the continuity uh, of several documents from the Department of Justice. You went as far back as the um, evaluation of corporate compliance programs, but even back uh, to the pilot program. I I would even suggest that we saw the beginnings of this in the 2012 FCPA guidance. But I see a continuing uh, effort by the Department of Justice to give the compliance practitioner substantive information about not only their thought process, but their views on current best practices. And in the, uh, certainly in the guidance, in the pilot program, in the 2007 evaluation of corporate compliance programs in 2017, and then the 2017 FCPA corporate enforcement policy uh, leading up to uh, the Binkowski memo and other uh, pronouncements in 2018, more transparency and more information for the compliance professional and uh, the compliance practitioner such as yourself. Uh, Do you see that evolution as well? 
Uh, it's a, Tom, you've really touched upon something very interesting, and that is that it, it is a clear evolution. And there are three or four different areas that seem to be emphasized over and over again in these different policy pronouncements and speeches that various uh, DOJ folks have, have given. Um, and the drumbeat keeps getting stronger and stronger. Uh, for example, we hear constantly this quest for accountability in companies. DOJ wants companies to demonstrate that they're holding the perpetrators accountable. I remember back at the white collar program in San Diego last year, Rosenstein said uh, that if a company wants to be uh, treated like a victim in these cases, it should start acting like a victim by holding the perpetrators accountable. And then when you look at some of the things that have been emphasized to us when we have been uh, monitors um, about the capability of a company to hold people accountable, then you're looking at some real basic compliance program principles. Do you have the kind of a hotline or helpline program that people are comfortable with from a culture standpoint? Are people willing to come forward and provide information? When they do, do you have the right kind of case management process? Do you have the right kind of investigative capability? We've seen many companies that have some pieces of this program put into place, but then when it's time to investigate an allegation of misconduct, they don't have the internal capability to do that. They don't have fraud examiners, uh, financial uh, auditors or others that can look into it and find out who did what. And then they don't have a fair and equitable disciplinary process to hold people accountable regardless of rank, tenure, or contribution to the company. So the accountability, the investigations, the reporting hotline, and then, of course, overall, whether an ethics and compliance program is appropriately resourced. That is the simplest and, and easiest thing that DOJ is going to be looking at. Are you providing the necessary resources to run the kind of effective compliance program, not just the paper program, but an effective program uh, that will remediate misconduct if there was a bad actor in place? So, Eric, unfortunately, we're near the end of our time. Uh, I've been visiting today with Eric Feldman, and we've been taking a look at whether a strong compliance program can be used as either a sword or a shield or perhaps both. I hope you'll join us tomorrow for our fifth and final episode where we tie it all together and look at the benefits of using a third party to fulfill the compliance mandate. Eric, thank you. Thank you very much, Tom. Hello, everyone. This is Tom Fox again. I hope you've enjoyed this episode and our exploration of strategies for corporations under the new DOJ guidance, which was issued in 2018. And I hope you'll join us again tomorrow for another episode. Please check out Affiliated Monitors at their website, www.affiliatedmonitors.com. Affiliated Monitors is the sponsor of this podcast. The podcast has been a special presentation of the Compliance Podcast Network.